Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Natural History Museum in London. My name is Claire Matteson, and on this World Environment Day, it's wonderful to be able to reach out to so many of you across the globe as we all make some time for nature. Today, we face a planetary emergency. Our future depends on the natural world, but we're not taking the effective action to combat, combat our own destructive impact on our planet. By threatening natural systems, we're threatening our own future. We must act now and we must act on scientific evidence. And importantly, we must act together. Only then will we, will we create a future where both people and planet thrive. Biodiversity is the lifeblood of our planet and the Natural History Museum is honored tonight to be hosting this panel with our ambassador and founder of A Voice for Nature Foundation, David de Rothschild. Explorer, campaigner and ecologist, David is well known for his passion and his commitment to the natural world. And as he says, who wouldn't want to spend time in nature trying to figure out ways to protect this incredible ecosystem and to be part of what is now much, a much more robust network of individuals working towards a remedy for a much more sustainable way of living. His fellow panelists tonight will highlight the importance of biodiversity to us all, showing how by working together with science at the heart, we can make a positive difference to our global future. So I'm delighted to welcome the United Nations Wilderness Patron, Ben Fogel, filmmaker and explorer, Celine Cousteau, Chief of Youth Education and Advocacy in the UN Environment Ecosystems Division, Ben uh, Sam Barrett, founder of urban rewilding scheme, Sugi Elise Van Middelum, and Dr. Sandy Knapp, our own Natural History Museum merit researcher in our life sciences department. And please do ask questions throughout the, discu the discussion on the chat bar, and we'll aim to include as many as we can. In today's very challenging times, the Natural History Museum is driving the campaign to create advocates for the planet. Advocates who will feel informed, confident, motivated to make wise decisions, get involved, and use their influence and actions to make a positive difference for our future. I thank you, David, the panel, and you, our audience, for being part of this movement for the future of our planet. Thank you for joining us, and I now have great pleasure in handing over to David, who will chair the discussion. Uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you to the museum and to all of you who have taken time out on a Friday to join us on World Environment Day, um, which is aptly named Time for Nature. Um, and I think, obviously, watching the museum, this incredible institution that I grew up um, running around in, looking at these cabinets of curiosity, fascinated um, by all these. Um, incredible specimens. And I think a lot of people don't realize how important, um, exactly how important and how live the science is that goes on inside of the Natural H History Museum. So thank you to the 300 scientists who work there every single day, um, the 700 papers that you produce, peer review papers that you produce every year um, to inform policymakers and stakeholders on our relationship to the natural world. And obviously, clearly the 80 million specimens that you hold inside of those incredible um, um, halls of yours and inside of the Darwin Center. Um, you know, it, it really strikes me as the role that the Natural History Museum plays is, is so vital because it gives us this connection to four and a half billion years of natural history from where we've come from and, and more importantly, where we need to go. Um, I think for me today, the panel um, is obviously very exciting because it is full of um, people who are experts in their field, um, passionate advocates for nature, and hopefully you too will be able to jump in and join the conversation, um, fire us questions, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, I think for me, clearly, um, it goes without saying um, that the pandemic has reminded me, um, apart from how uh, valuable and precious all life is on this planet, just how deeply interconnected we are and codependent we all are as a species. Business, society, nature, you, me, we all are the same. Nature is us uh, and we are nature. Um, I think it's been clear that for a number of years now, decades now, um, we have really been pressing the snooze button um, on this wake up call that nature has been giving us. Um, it is clearly 
um, uh, you know, a time for reflection. I said to someone the other day, I feel like nature has sent me to my room to reflect. Um, this year um, was called the super year of biodiversity. It was in fact 10 years ago to this month um, that the uh, UN decided they would create this decade of biodiversity. It's a phrase that we hear now quite often in the media. It's a phrase that maybe a lot of you um, uh, are sort of uh, au fait with. But I also think it's quite interesting to recognize that it's a phrase that was really only popularized um, in the 80s, which is not that long ago when you think about our four and a half billion years of natural history. Um, E.O. Wilson, um, Tom Joy, um, E.O. Wilson, who was you know, framed as the father of, of um, biodiversity in a way, um, it, it, you know, sort of popularized it in his publications and brought it to um, sort of a mainstream audience. So tonight, um, we have an incredible panel made up of uh, um, speakers, distinguished speakers, who is going, who are going to frame this conversation. Uh, um, you know, as I said, we have this super year. The pandemic has clearly caused unavoidable delays um, to the global negotiations. We're going to move out of 2020. What comes next? What is um, the framework for biodiversity going forward? And so I, with that in mind, I think it would be great to jump straight into Sandy. And I'd love to call Sandy the godmother of biodiversity if she's um, comfortable with that. She's printed um, many, many books, several books. She's authored 200 peer reviewed journals. Um, you know, Sandy, if, if you would like to kick us off, um, as I said, the, the, the sort of term biodiversity was really sort of um, coined by um, Walter G. Rosen in 85 and then E.O. Wilson in 88. Um, you know, essentially, what, what do you see? I mean, how do you unlock that phrase biodiversity? What is it to you? And in some way, should we be putting these labels like the super year? Um, onto um, a phrase like biodiversity. Surely biodiversity is just a way of life? In, in a way, biodiversity, you said it in the beginning, is biodiversity is us. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight, because it's going to be very exciting to be chatting with all of you. Is, is biodiversity is one of those things that's almost too big to think about. But I don't think we should be afraid of that. Because many, many ideas and concepts, we shy away from things that are, that, are, that are so big. So if you look at the way that the United Nations has defined biodiversity, it's the diversity of all of life and the diversity of all of life's interactions. So that means diversity, not just how many species we have in our back gardens or how many species there are in the Amazon, but it means the genetic diversity within each species. So if you look at all of us around the globe, there's a huge amount of genetic diversity in just the human species. So it's the genetic diversity. It's that diversity of species, which a species name is just a label that we give to something to be, enable us to talk about it. It's that level that we think about as being biodiversity. But it's also the diversity of ecosystems and functioning units in nature and also the relationships between organisms and between organisms and the planet that they're on. So because it's so big, it's something that that one often feels that, you know, well, I can't possibly do anything about that. I can't possibly help that. I can't possibly understand that. I can't possibly um, conserve that. I can't, you know, it, it's too, it's almost too big. But actually, the great thing about big problems and big issues is that if you start with just a little tiny piece, you can make a huge amount of progress. So I, as a scientist, as a biodiversity scientist or a plant biodiversity science, I start with my little tiny piece that I understand these plants, how they interact with their environment, who they are, what they do in their daily lives, and, and I, I can make progress there and add it up with the progress of all the other people who are doing their little piece. I think we can do it together. I mean, is it fair? I mean, for me, when I think of biodiversity, I sort of think about it as, um, in essence, a sort of gigantic library of solutions to various biological challenges. I mean, you know, nature has this incredible um, network, um, this web of life, um, which we are part of, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and clearly, recently, we've yanked on one of these strings in the web of life too hard and it's come back to bite us a little well, bit. I think we've yanked on quite a few of them recently. <laughs> but, but, but if you think about those solutions, those solutions are the results of millions of years of evolution of organisms um, changing and going on to reproduce in different types of environments. And the, the rate of change that we see currently 
is is there's always been change. I mean, one of the things that 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 we know when we look at the natural world is that there has there is always change. We change. I mean, there's change in our own lives. We change from when we're six months old to to what we are today. We 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 change all the time, but that change is um has happened in in a time scale which is very different to the change which is happening to our to our ecosystems and environments today, and evolution doesn't proceed at that same rate. And so yeah. we have we've we've pulled enough strings that we've caused a sort of a, a big disconnect, a really big disconnect. So talking of big disconnects, um, you know, we often think of nature as out there. Um, we talk about it as you know, there's you know, as often as there's nature in us. I want to bring in our next guest, um, Ben, um, Ben Fogel, who some people will know as um, an incredible explorer. Ben's the kind of person you you know you want to be when you grow up. Um, with his map and his boat and everything in the background there. Um, and he's known for these incredible daring feats. But there is, uh, there's a, you have this label, Ben, um, as a UN patron for the wilderness. And I think, you know, it couldn't be more important now in this role of what would you contextualize wilderness? Do we have to go out there to find wilderness? Or can wilderness be in us and around us? Of course. You know, I think it's an interesting, it was a great segue that because where Sandy was talking about this disconnect, I suppose what I've tried to do over the last 20 years of, of travel and experiences is, is to try to connect with, with everyone there. So David, you and I, we've been lucky enough to go to polar regions and uh, we, we get this, this, um, this great title, explorer or adventurer, but let's, be, let's, let's not give away all our secrets. We're, we're, we're incredibly lucky to do it. It's not so hard. There's this, there's this yeah. notion that um, it's a battle to go out to the wilderness. It's a battle between man and nature, but it, it's not. It's a dance. It's a beautiful dance. And, and as soon as you accept the fact that actually this should be a symbiotic relationship, it, is, it shouldn't be all take, which is what humans have, have been doing for millennia. As soon as we show great respect, and you're forced to do that when you're on an expedition or when you're immersed within the natural world, um, it, it all becomes clear. And, and, and to go back to your question, wilderness is, is us. I, I feel like um, I am part of the wilderness. When we talk of biodiversity, for me, I feel we are all a part of this thing. We, we can take um, just as much from the natural world internally, uh, in our mental well-being, in our livelihoods, um, in, in our kind of lifestyle. Um, that doesn't just mean destroying and taking the minerals and, and the wood and um, uh, actual elements from it. Yeah, I mean, I, I just a question has just come in actually sort of saying, why do you think having access to wildlife is so important? Um, you know, I mean, I think that's a question probably for both Sandy and for you, Ben, clearly. Um, we've got other guests in the background waiting who will be answering that. Um, why is access to nature so important? Good question. So, Sandy, why don't you start? Well, I, in, in a way, in a way, um, I think it's because it reminds us that we're not the most important thing. With access to access to other access to other people should remind us that we're not the most important people, but access to the rest of the diversity of life actually should remind us that we're not separate from that. But also, I think it's been it, it's it's very clear that people observing nature very closely during during this time of lockdown, which actually one could turn it on its head and say it's not a lockdown, it's an opening up of people's perceptions of nature, even in their tiny back gardens. And, and from an incredibly personal point of view, I think actually looking at something closely and thinking about how it works is incredibly good for your mental health. It's incredibly good for how you feel about yourself. It's good for how you feel about, well, about, about your interrelationships with everything, really. But that's a very and, and I, view. I, I, I agree with everything Sandy has said there. When, when you are on a mountain, uh, when you are in a jungle, in a desert, on, on the middle of the ocean, and you're forced um, to rely on your own wits, on your own resourcefulness, it gives you a very different perception. And, mm -hmm. and to take this, the, the parallels with the, the worldwide lockdown or, or opening up, as Sandy has described it, that many people have experienced. For the first time, we've tried to be on our, on our own. I've got a huge veg patch growing in the bottom of my garden now. We, we've been fantastically resourceful as a family. And I've, 
I suppose I've taken some of those expedition elements where you were acutely aware of not wasting anything, of only using things you need, not what you want. And, and I think that, that as soon as you are immersed within nature, which can be in your backyard, it can be in a window box outside your window, it doesn't have to be out there in what is often described as the mm -hmm. wilderness. It, yep. it, it gives you this, this um, tangible connect. I think it can be as tiny as a postage stamp. I mean, you know, you can have one geranium on your balcony, one little plant on your balcony and watch the bees come to it and just think about the interconnectivity of things. And it makes you feel, it makes one feel part. Of yeah, something totally. I, and, I, and to echo those sentiments, I mean, I would also say, you know, access to nature is, is for me anyway, my journey has, you know, as a naturopath, the connection between health and nature, I think is so important. We're at a time where I think in isolation, in lockdown, a lot of people have felt loneliness and, and disconnected from a community. We are a species of many species. We are, um, we, you know, we operate well together. Yes, we have our problems, but we are, um, you know, we are, we, we are a herd. Right. And, and actually, we can work together well. We can. We want to belong. And going out into nature or spending time looking at that bee on your balcony gives you a sense of connection to something bigger than yourself. Um, talking of um, big environments, I mean, clearly, one of the greatest threats to biodiversity is the loss of trees. Um, you know, according to a recent report, we have um, about three trillion trees on the planet. Um, which equates to not that many per person, only 150 trees per person. It sounds a lot, but when you put it into context that in the last 40 years, a size um, roughly approximately the size of um, Europe has gone in terms of um, deforestation um, and half the world's rainforests have been destroyed in just one century. So, you know, it's no surprise why these tropical rainforests and these forests are disappearing. It's clearly to do with um, a number of exploitations of our natural resources. Um, I read a very sad statistic um, yesterday as I was researching for this panel that said, if we continue on this trajectory in 79 years, there will be no more rainforests left. So with that, I'd like to bring in um, Celine Cousteau, um, who is also an incredible explorer and advocate, not only for the oceans, but for um, the lungs of our planet. Um, Celine, you've spent a ton of time um, advocating for not only um, the natural world, but the connection between human and nature, what, I, what you phrase tribes on the edge. Um, I think the work that you've been doing to elevate and give voice to the voiceless has been incredible to helping me myself understand more about the complexities of the, the Amazon and the rainforest of the world, but more importantly, the interaction with those teachers um, that we can all learn from, which are those, those tribes on the edge. Um, for you right now, do you feel that this pandemic that we've been in, this sort of collapse of biodiversity, is, it, you know, it wasn't a matter of um, um, if, but when. Um, do you feel that, um, you know, now we will get a platform to have this conversation? And do you think there is enough space in the mean, mainstream media to have this conversation? And I'll open that to the rest of the panel as well after this. Is there space um, to have this conversation now? Um, it, it's always been time to have the conversation. Um, we have an opportunity now that we can seize to really push the conversation forward. Um, we have no more excuses of, oh, I can't travel. Well, nobody can travel, but we have this. Um, the conversation has always been available to us. It's whether or not we are willing to, to have it and then take action. Um, I've been going to the Brazilian and the Peruvian Amazon since I was nine years old. And as you were mentioning, have a connection with that rainforest and with the jungle. And I think the greatest teachers are there in the midst of the forest. Um, some of my most crucial and uh, life lessons were delivered to me very simply um, by indigenous leaders who with just one sentence kind of completely opened up my mind and my soul to realize that we, we get into the complexity of the connection of humans and nature and why nature is important and the idea of exploration and the idea of um, having to have all these titles in order to understand nature. It's something they grow up with because it's, it's their home um, and there is no other way to live but in balance with nature. And so the question doesn't even pose itself. When uh, in 2007, I went to the Amazon and asked an indigenous leader, how do you live sustainably in your environment? He looked at me going, I don't understand. And I thought, okay, it's a, it's a language issue. Let me simplify sustainability. And I realized very quickly when he looked at me like I was absolutely insane 
um, that in fact, there's just no other way to live. So there's no question to ask. And if we can stop for a moment and think about that and go back to that very basic idea that we don't exist without nature, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, then we start educating ourselves. And I think like everybody on the panel and yourself included, we do have a lot to say about the importance of biodiversity and the importance of nature. But that relationship between humans and nature is I think how we get to the general public to say this is, this is why you are part of nature and not apart from nature. Everything we do depends on the environment, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, the clothes that we wear, the, the furniture we sit on. And if that nature, that environment isn't protected, we all suffer. So for me, it's, it's not a question of is now the right time, it's overdue time. Um, I wanna go back to something that Ben said earlier and, and you had mentioned in terms of being an explorer as well. Um, because I often get labeled explorer and I'm, I'm always questioning, what does that mean? Um, I think the true meaning of being an explorer is exploring yourself wherever you are. Absolutely. And if you take yourself out of your comfort zone and put yourself in a place of discomfort, you learn a lot about who you are and your capacity to grow. So I do encourage people to go to the national parks. I do encourage people to grow a garden, even if they think they can't. I'm I'm terrible at root vegetables, but I really try. <laughs> and I think all those things are important because we realize that the more we, we get close to nature, the more it just becomes innate. Um, and the more we remember that in fact, it's always been there. I, I agree with you, Celine. I mean, just to echo your sentiments on that being called an explorer, I've always felt rather uncomfortable with it. What, I, what I've sort of contextualized that at really is just being curious and remaining curious. And I would say, you know, a lot of people often say to me, well, is an expiration dead? Isn't it over? And I would, I would say we're actually in the golden age of expiration because we have tools today like never before to allow us to see nature and the planet connect with each other. Citizen science, it's a big pillar of the museum and everybody I know on this panel, um, you know, we really can as individuals now um, look at the world, share our thoughts and really explore our back gardens all the way through to outer space. Um, and there was a question that just came in saying, um, you know, earlier that how can people feel more connected to these big issues um, that seem insurmountable to the general public? It seems impossible to act alone against global threats like deforestation, which is a great segue um, to bring in Elise, who is the founder of Sugi. Um, Elise, I met a year ago, um, and I think Elise could have written this question. Um, and, you know, <laughs> literally, maybe she did write the question. Um, but Elise, Elise said something really beautiful, which is a forest can be tiny. It doesn't have to be big. And I think an action can start with an individual um, and, and can obviously flow um, you know, into something much bigger. And I, I don't think we should underestimate the power of that individual action, um, whether it is planting your root vegetables or whether it is signing a petition or whether it is talking um, about the issues with your community and persuading individuals. So um, I wanna bring in Elise now um, to, to talk about really as an individual, um how you had this exact sentiment i think when i met you you said i got frustrated with you know the idea that you know changing the world was outside of my control and i wanted to create transparency and i wanted to bring that sense of rewilding the, the, the you know the environment and rewilding yourself back into um everyday life how, how did you go about that and why, why didn't you talk to that question of can an individual make a difference thank you david hello everyone <laughs> Good to see you. So I'll have to rewind a little bit on that. So at a certain point in my life, two years ago, um, I wanted to commemorate a very important time. And I decided I wanted to plant trees because like all of you, um, I love to go into the forest and reconnect. And re the relationship with the nature and with the forest has always been key to whatever I've done. So I found myself going through all these websites, tree planting, and all I saw was massive canopies and children with saplings in their hands. But the experience left me a little, I didn't really know, I couldn't connect with it. It was like, is there really a restoration of ecosystems happening? How are these trees being planted? Do they really like maintain the trees? And what's really happening? So I ended up planting two or donating 200 apple trees uh, in a community on the border of Nepal and Tibet. And that actually sparked um, to create Sugi because that summer, um, about two years ago, I woke up and I thought, you know, what is really happening with my trees now? Why can't I open my phone? What, I mean, have they planted the trees? Are they watering them? 
So then I thought, you know, today we open a phone for anything and any, everything. So I said, why not create an app where you actually could plant and you could also request a forest and then you can also gift a forest and also follow the, the growth of your forest. So the app actually is, and, and we spoke about that. I mean, you touched upon all these points. It's giving access to forest making. Um, we, we plan, I mean, the network of forest makers that work with us, they grow tiny, ultra dense, forest according to a Japanese technique. So only native species. And the forest can be of a size of like five by two meters. That could be a forest size. Um, we can go larger. Actually, exactly a year ago, we started with our first forest in Beirut. And uh, it was quite an epic moment to work with that community and really bring a green zone into, I mean, a city that really is not really so connected to, to nature anymore. So that is a little bit the idea with you is that turning negative spaces into positive places. We were urban because I thought the ability to be able to go into the forest so close by might be an experience for people. They, anyone could connect with it, um, nurture it, ma help maintain it. So today when there's a planting happening or a maintenance or volunteering, and I mean, we had volunteers coming from everywhere so that's a little bit <laughs> thank you elise we've got some great questions coming in i i feel like we're leaving one character out in the wilderness um which is uh the final panelist i think we should bring him in um so he doesn't feel left out which is sam barrett sam is um an incredible man who has spent his um time um advocating a voice for nature um and really is someone i admire who has sort of orchestrated a lot of the themes the global thematic themes around world environment day um, and, and brought together many, many changes um, around policy and, and, um, and, and nature and biodiversity. So Sam, you know, we sort of been heading in this direction that leads us sort of towards this dead end street when it comes to the sort of biodiversity, um, if we continue on this path. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in saying, you know, are we just sleepwalking? Are we gonna go back after the pandemic to business as usual? How do we find new momentum? How do we sort of shift the consciousness in this moment of reflection that nature's given us? Um, I know you've recently launched some incredible platforms to do exactly that, to harness um, you know, a new way of thinking and viewing nature. Why don't you jump in and, and talk a little bit about that um, and what you've been up to? Great, uh, thanks, David. Um, so my wilderness was uh, the People's Republic of Watford in the North London. And, um, <laughs> I had an amazing teacher called Mrs. Wolf who created the Countryside Club. And I spent my time just um, climbing trees, doing a book called the uh, was it Willie the Waxwing and Birds Monkey. I saw for 25p in the playground. And I wrote to Sir Peter Scott because I was into birds about lefty and righty and his swans. And he wrote me the most incredible letter back about where he thinks the swans are. And I think for me, childhood is redolent with the evocation of nature. And so, uh, I live in Nairobi now, we have bush babies, we have Sykes monkeys, we have all kinds of wildlife just outside my office, it's incredible. But I feel like we are what we teach and we value uh, things that we think have a price, which we need to turn upside down. So my take on this story is um, the value of education, I think is priceless. And the generation we have right now, I think doesn't see the purpose or the role of nature in their lives which means that it has been diminished. And so what we've done here is we've created something called Earth School with TED and about 60 partners to get 30 brilliant environmental education lessons up into the world. Um, we're starting to talk to education ministers about how do we have a curriculum that's fit for purpose. So you don't have environment in either geography or science but everywhere. Uh, but we're also thinking about how do we go beyond the classroom. So um, we've been working with the scouts on a new project called Earth Tribe but they're putting all their environmental education for 50 million kids on a platform today. Um, and I'm also working with the video gaming industry, which reaches 2.6 billion people, um, to see how can they put green nudges in games, how can they decarbonize their platforms uh, and use their influence to change the future. But I think how we talk about the future is what shapes it. And I think a lot of the narrative on biodiversity is one that's not based on, on hope and possibility but also on this kind of abusive relationship that we almost have with ourselves. 
Um, but I think there's a lot of great kind of um, green shoots of recovery that we're starting to see. They're not enough. But what Elise has spoken about is awesome. Um, and I think for us, the COVID moment um, is a chance to learn back better and reappreciate what we have around us. So as we emerge from lockdown and, and kind of reacquaint ourselves with the world again, uh, I think it's a chance to make maybe a new promise to nature. But also we need a new era of politics that sees environment as core to what we do. Um, and I think environment ministries have often not had the power and the punch that they need. And so we need to elevate their status and make environment an everybody issue within both politics, the pupils, uh, and within people as well. And I, I think we can all play our part, whether you're living in Watford or Nairobi or wherever you are listening to this. Uh, there's all things that we can do. And I, I think... Um, yeah, I think for me, everything is still up for grabs. We're in a tight spot. Um, but if we have hope and we have belief, then everything is possible. I think I can... so you said, you said, Sam, it's really interesting. It just struck a chord with me. I'm sorry to butt in, David. But, uh, but is, is it seems to me what you're saying, in a way, is that nature and biodiversity can no longer be background. Because it's often perceived as background. To what it is we do and we're doing all this stuff in the foreground and there's biodiversity back there in the background whereas it isn't background it's it's us exactly yeah mm -hmm. i think i think that's a really good point sandy to bring up and i mean mm -hmm. I, let's open that up i mean i think you cannot have a conversation about the biodiversity without bringing in to play um our consumer habits consumerism and capitalism um and the model we've created um you know around sort of the exploitation of nature um, you know, our, basically our health and well-being as a species is clearly linked to nature. Um, you know, we bail out and we've seen trillions and trillions of dollars flow back into supporting these businesses um, that, let's be clear, most of which um, are using in their uh, supply chain nature in some capacity, often to um, can be exploiting nature in their supply chain and not only nature, um, the, the human context to that as well. So how do we change that, that sort of that that heavy machine of capitalism and consumerism um how do we make nature as herman daly said um you know how do we make the economy a substrate of uh, of, of uh, um uh, the economy a substrate of nature H how can we approach that i mean I'll, I'll open that up to any of you to jump in on that we were gonna we were gonna have this sign language yeah. which we could do so um, we're gonna. So Celine's got a hand up in a very awesome way. So Celine, why don't you well, jump I'm, in? I'm pointing to Ben and to Elise. <laughs> 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 no, I was, I was just gonna give an example. There's a um, there's a great um, uh, there's a great example in Madagascar called, called the Voiman Reserve um, that was started by a French gentleman named Olivier Béra. Um, and I know of it because I visited and we were filming in Madagascar uh, last year. And essentially what he's created is a way to regenerate and replant this small-ish area, but important with 5,000 trees replanted, bring back the wildlife, but then revitalize the local economy and the local community by giving them something to benefit from by keeping the environment intact. And so what they've created essentially is the local community has created a co-op. Everybody has a job that they've chosen um, and that they must accomplish in order to bring in a salary in, but they collect wild plants from this protected area and bring them in to make essential oils, which then gets sold. So the economy comes back to the local people and the motivation is perhaps financial, but the way there is by protecting the environment. And so I think there's examples like this that, that we can look at that may or may not be repl replicable everywhere or at a large scale, but I do think it's notable to say, well, if this is a formula that works, how can we apply it in other ecosystems, in other countries, in other ways? Um, because there's a buyer for a product. So how can the buyer for that product um, essentially benefit the humans and the environment? And so we understand that actually, you know, you can make a living by protecting the environment. It's not just for nonprofits and, and you know, diehard environmentalists who are just, you know, Birkenstock wearing like me, just to hug in trees and keep them down, you know, but it's, I do think that there is smart business in it um, and that we need to see it as, as something that we can, I know this is probably a dirty word in this environment, but that is that we can profit from. Because if you don't speak that language, we're, there's a lot of people that aren't gonna come on board. 
those of us who are passionate and know and understand and feel, we're going to stay here till the end and fighting for it. But we need to bring the other side on board. And so we need to speak their language. It doesn't mean yeah. I know how to do it all the time, but. <laughs> I'm going I'm to throw something to you guys and I'm going to jump into some questions, but I'm going to give you something to think about, which we'll circle back at the end. There's a great quote by Buckminster Fuller, who was obviously uh, coined the phrase spaceship Earth. He said to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave you with that as panelists to think about what is the new model to make the existing model obsolete, which we can circle back to close this talk. But I want to jump back into a few questions um, that are sort of playing into some of this. Um, someone's just come in and said, um, we are moving into a two system, global markets and local political mm -hmm. systems. Sorry, we are moving into two systems, global markets and local political systems. How should we address the environmental policies in this context? Um, who wants to tackle that one? Sam, do you wanna have a go as a, as a, as a policy whiz? Um, I'll do my best. Um, I feel like, uh the covid opportunity won't be there forever and decisions are being made now and how we reshape uh supply chains globalization the nature of politics is really up for grabs and and what conditions are placed on bailouts and and how we kind of reshape the world covid is the best man-made natural disaster because it literally is that we've, we've ever had and as we move into recovery we've got some really important choices to make and i feel now is the time for people to raise their voices more than ever uh so that we can really have a planet that we need to sustain ourselves so i think that's answering half the question and then in terms of local political systems my sense is it's yes and uh, i think we need the macro Macro and the two work in harmony together. Uh, and I think it's only when we find our voice enough, we find our agency that change can happen. So I think the two work in play. And I think disempowerment and cynicism and a sense of things aren't possible or what can I do, mm. they're kind of cancerous on this quest. And so it's how we can get people to have a sense of belief and possibility. And then that unlocks things in a way that we, we can't imagine. Do you think we need to change the narrative? I mean, Ben, you've spent your time, I mean, all of us are storytellers, right? Um, we, as, as a sort of passionate environmentalist or as conservationist or as biologist or botanists or, um, you know, whatever you want to label yourself, um, sometimes I find myself becoming a bit of an undertaker for the wilderness, you know, to, to sort of just talking about the demise of nature, what's wrong with nature. And, you know, I read this beautiful stat the other day that in every handful of forest saw there are more creatures than there are people on this planet. We're so small, we're so tiny. Um, how do we change um, our story to drive optimism and hope in a, in a time where there feels like there's a lot of divisiveness, a lot of fear-based narratives in the media, a lot of catastrophe around the corner. I know we need a little bit of a stick, but how do we as storytellers throw out um, that sort of, that, you know, just the positivity that drives us? I mean, it's hope has to drive us more than despair, surely. Um, David, I think it's really important that, 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 that you just said something really important there about that, you know, in a handful of soil, there's more diversity than there is, you know, there's there's more diversity than there is in the rainforest. So so it, it's the it's seeing the diversity everywhere and the fact that diversity gives us resilience. And so re, and resil and, and and focusing on resilience, focusing on kind of um, on, on that idea that that diversity and it's not just diversity of nature, it's diversity of people as well. We're a diverse species. We're a diverse. We we have a huge. As Celine was talking about, we have a huge diversity of experience, and it's actually um, seeing that diversity as positive and learning from that diversity, not just amongst people, but also from nature. That that I think is a really positive. It's a positive way of looking at at the world around us, really. Ben, you I'm were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I've always seen myself as a positive campaigner. I, I've always been driven by the carrot rather than the stick. I like to take mm. the impossible and try to show people it's possible. So when I climbed Mount Everest, having rarely done any mountaineering before, I tried to do it as a symbolic gesture to people that you need to have respect, you need to put in um, uh, due diligence and training, but if you really want something, you can achieve it. So Sam, going back to what you say, people feel overwhelmed. Again, just to take those expedition parallels, when, when I rode across the Atlantic Ocean, it was unimaginable, day one of, of what turned out into a, a multi-month expedition. 
it was so daunting and it looked impossible. That was my brick wall. But once once you go past, once you, you, you break that, that wall, um, you suddenly realize that actually we can do these things. You feel empowered. And I don't want to overuse this word, but it's all about empowerment in, in my mind. You, you need to infuse people. Natural History Museum, I, I, th I think we have to, to, to mention that today, like you, David. Yep. That was my childhood. I mean, I, I yeah. was an urban boy. I grew up in central London. I couldn't have been more urban if you tried. And the Natural History Museum was my little window into the natural world. That was literally, we didn't even have a garden in my house. So, so for me as a child, that's where my passion, that the tiny little flame began and it grew and grew and grew. And, and as a storyteller, I just try to share my experiences so that a child in a, a school who maybe hasn't had that opportunity to visit a national park or to uh, get to a, a, a remarkable outside space can feel um, a passion for what we are all trying to preserve. And, and final thought on that, exactly what uh, Sam and Sandy said, it's taking nature and biodiversity from the background and putting it into the foreground. And, and this, this period of global lockdown has suddenly people have become obsessed with outside space and gardens mm. and nature. People cannot wait to breathe that fresh air. And now is the time to pounce. I've got a, a bunch of questions coming in. I'm conscious that we have 15 minutes left. So I want to try and get some of these questions into the group. So let's, uh, let's throw out some answers. Sandy, I've got one in um, that says, what's the Natural History Museum doing to understand and protect bi biodiversity? Um, I know well, there's a lot, wow. of, a lot of stuff, but like, well, wow. give, us a, give, us, give, us, give us a few. I mean, you've got that beautiful garden out front. <laughs> so so there, are, there are more than 300 of us scientists at the museum, and all of us study some aspect of biodiversity, well, and geodiversity of the earth, the diversity of, of the earth itself as well. And some of us do things like describe and discover new species, and some of us do things like use the information that others produce to predict trajectories for where we should put agriculture or where urban development could happen. So it's a huge range of things that we're doing to both understand, but also to try to, to help create those futures that Sam was talking about, where we do put nature at the center of all it is that we do. So the range of things is incredible. That, that we do. And that's why working at the Natural History Museum for me is an unbelievable privilege. I mean, you guys talked about going there as children and I didn't grow up in London and didn't grow up in a place where there even was a Natural History Museum. But for me, working at the museum is an incredible privilege just because I'm surrounded by people, all of whom are thinking really deeply about these questions, but all of whom look at them in a very different way. And so by, by exchanging, by that diversity of views and the diversity of perspectives, that's how we can make progress, I think. So I hope that's, I hope that's an answer that satisfies whoever asked that question a little bit, because it would be, I mean, I could sit here and talk for days about what the Natural History Museum is doing. I, I mean, I would, I, would, I would jump in on that and just say, you know, obviously the Natural History Museum has been creating nature noughts. There's the Center for UK Biodiversity, the uh, Angela Marmot Center, which you guys support. Mm -hmm. If you've got species that you're seeing and finding in your backyard during lockdown, you can snap them with your phone, you can upload them yep. to a database. Decentralization, citizen science is absolutely at the heart of the new we're, strategy we're, for the museum as well. So that's that leads to where technology we're comes all, into We're play. all scientists. We're all, all of us. Uh, all, every uh, one of us is a scientist. Every one of us does an experiment every day. We try to get up a little bit later and still do what we need to do. But we're all, we can also all, every one of us can become an advocate for this planet. Everyone can be an advocate for the planet. You don't need a special degree. You don't need to even be able to climb Mount Everest. I don't think I could climb Mount Everest. <laughs> but we can all be advocates for the planet. And that, and that is really what, the Natural History Museum is about. And that I goes back to Elise. Know. Oh, sorry, I was going to just say, ask, I was going to circle Elise in on that because we got a question that was coming in about sort of carbon offsetting. What can I do? Individual actions. Mm -hmm. A little bit more about just, you know, again, um, you know, that sort of, um, that idea, Elise, of anything's possible, um, you know, urban rewilding. Give us a, just a quick set, sort of like impact and uh, projects that you've done in urban environments and, and how anyone can sort of get involved because I think that's really important as a way to offset as we start to emerge. I hear offsetting a lot, just writing a check maybe to some organization that you don't really know what they're up to might not always be the best approach. So how can we have a hands-on approach to conservation and offsetting our impact? I'll, I'll throw that to all of you, Elise, but maybe Celine, then you can jump in next. 
Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, offsetting big topic, just to steer away from that for a second and go into like, what is it we do and what kind of projects do we tackle? So when we started a year ago, in Be we started with Beirut. Right now we have projects going on from Australia to Pakistan to India, to Romania, Mallorca, up to the, to the States. These projects are, they're not the, the, the million acre projects. They're, they're tiny projects, but everything that you've been saying throughout the conversations, they tie into that, right? It's for people being able to say like, where can I go through a wild? Like, how far do I have to go into a forest? Well, with, with what we do and with the services that we provide, you can actually partake in that. It doesn't have to be far away. A forest doesn't need to be a far from space. It can be right around the corner. Um, and, and I think this is a, a beautiful proposition in a way, not just to be, but just think about it, like all the obsolete concrete we have, the, parks that are abandoned or abandoned places or parking spaces that are just too many of them. So we can actually turn them into tiny jungle where biodiversity thrives. And like you say, you know, it's all starts, it all starts with soil. And what really is your carbon intake? We don't, it's hard to measure because the Miyawaki method, we plant four to five trees on a square meter. So we create really dense, tiny jungles and it starts again, re restoration of ecosystem starts with the soil. Now, I'm not the scientist, but I saw firsthand what happened in Beirut. When we worked the earth, we took out tires, bombshells, plastic, anything. Then there was no more nutrient in the soil. We brought back just through compost um, the soil. And today it's this really dark soil that you can find in the forest. And the trees go above our heads and we can find birds and, and, and species again that were, that were gone. So I think the proposition that we really would like to look at is like, well, if we like to invest in nature and restore biodiversity and really bring back ecosystems. Um, now. Celine, Celine, to jump in on, on you, um, you know, the sort of, just give us a little bit more about the human element. Um, you know, you you work very closely with these custodians, these these uh, you know these libraries of knowledge um, that we seem to ignore and push into the background. You know, these indigenous communities that are still holding strong um, against all odds. And and I say against all odds because the absolute worst thing that's happening right now in the jungles in the Amazon is the most. Um, disgusting exploitation of nature I've ever seen. Um, how do they hold on? How do we help them? How do we elevate their voice like you've done? And, and how does that tie into this conversation? Um, well, first of all, I, I, um, they hold on because they want to live. Um, and I think if we as a species were all closer to nature, it would just be obvious to us every day um, that you have to fight for it. And I think when you are that close to nature, you realize that your very survival depends on it. You don't mess it up um, because there won't be a tomorrow. So for me, you know, the days I get asked sometimes, you know, how are you so optimistic? And I kind of sit there like, I don't know that I am optimistic. I choose to be, mm -hmm. but I choose to be every day. You wake up in the morning and you realize that there are people fighting for a cause fill in the blank of what that causes every single day. And here we are, people of privilege. We have a platform on which to share our voices, a platform in which to do our work, our professional work. We've been blessed with access. Um, what's our excuse? And so for me, the, the idea that, oh, I'm only one person, it's not gonna make a difference is, is uh, weak and is an excuse of course we can make a difference. And if you are only one person with the skills of an accountant, use those for the organizations that need pro bono labor. If you are a scientist, phenomenal. If you have the ability of the gab, use it. If you have access to schools because you're an educator, give them access to information in nature and education. So that's, you know, the indigenous people in the Amazon that I work with are the guardians of an ecosystem we all depend on. And they, their lives are being systematically threatened for the exploitation of natural resources on their land. 
20% of our oxygen comes from the Amazon. There's no deforestation on indigenous land. There's incredible biodiversity there that we all depend on. Why are we not protecting the guardians more? Because human rights and land rights are biodiversity rights. Mm -hmm. It's completely intertwined. And I get, I get, uh, I guess, labeled um, giving a voice to the voiceless, and um, I, I want to correct that. They have a voice. They have a very clear, strong voice. It's our job to create a bridge to give them a platform to be heard. Um, the those who are oppressed, and we're seeing it. And I know that's not the discussion. I won't get into it, but there are people oppressed the world over. Um, it's our job to to help them be heard. So we've got six minutes left. Thank you, Celine. Um, that means there's six of you, or myself included, on this. Um, uh, six of us on this uh, feed. I want to just jump in and um, touch on very quickly in the last minute. If I was to give you a minute each, um, just to sort of wrap up some of your thoughts on what we can all do as individuals um, to um, help support biodiversity, wilderness, um, and and how to sort of reconnect with nature. And, and, and bring this sort of conversation to a bit of a close. So whoever wants to jump in first, we could start with you, Sandy, and work our way around, if that helps, or, or Sam, whoever. You choose. I mean, I, you know, I've been watching the questions come in, and there's some really interesting questions about, about you know, yep. it's more important to do things on your own doorstep rather than tell other countries what to do. And I actually agree with Celine, is I think we have to, we have to use our positions, our position as institutions and our position as people to, to do something, however small that might be. And we have a project at the Natural History Museum called the Urban Nature Project, which is to take our own front garden and turn it into something better for biodiversity. And I think if, if we as an institution can try to do that, and I try to do that with my own little tiny kind of two by two little patch of, patch of um, greenness in London, that if we, can, if we can take the responsibility to actually make a difference, even if it feels like nobody else sees, because it doesn't matter if somebody else sees it or you get credit for it. Biodiversity and the diversity of life on Earth will pay you back. Ben, we've got some questions coming about wilderness, how to protect it um, as well. Give us some more on, 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 on that role of wilderness and how to rewild yourself. Well, it's a million dollar question. I could talk for hours, but, but to, to keep it short and sweet, I think it is about rewilding ourselves. And I'm not asking everyone to go and live in the wilderness or go and uh, have a great expedition in the wilderness. That would be a disaster, quite frankly. But I think we can all be softer. I think we need to take away this hard edge. I think we need to change our consumerism and materialism from um, a want to need. What do we need rather than what we want? And, and I think we just need to become slightly more selfless and less selfish. I think I think we, we got caught up in a system and all you need to do is spend a little bit of time in a, 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 a beautiful green natural area, whether that's an inner city park, listen to the birds, watch the insects and you'll feel calmer. And if you if you imagine that this is rewilding us, this is good for our mental well-being, this is good for us as individuals then perhaps maybe we will all be motivated to actually make a change. Thank you, Ben. Sam? Um, I think what we determine how much biodiversity we'll have left in the world, 60% of biodiversity loss is due to food systems. Um, and our carbon footprint comes to our diets, where we live and how we travel. And so the choices that we make in our suburban, urban lifestyles have significant and dramatic impact on nature. So if we can live a little bit smarter and make some different choices, then I think we can all play our own small world, a role on this. Hmm. And we've got a new initiative about creating a billion actions uh, that would really take carbon footprint down and send the signal both up to the private sector and government that people want to see change. And so I would just say small actions kind of add up mm -hmm. and none of us are small in the choices that we take on a day-to-day -day basis. It can feel overwhelming, like anything I do doesn't make a difference, but if we all think like that, then we get paralyzed. And I just think, just to build on what Ben said, um, let's just, think about how we can be kinder to ourselves and kinder to the world. 
mm. and just be a bit more generous with the choices that we can make because every choice that we make has a consequence. Thank you, Sam. Over to you, Elise. <laughs> I would I'm just think because I would love to pick up on that word overwhelming. I think today, um, I mean, any event, many events happening, and I think it's all a little bit overwhelming on us, on our selves on our being and i just saw a question there how do you connect with nature i mean I'm not going to say that i have the exact answer but i do think i mean feeling is that nature is inside of us and so connecting with nature can also be connecting with yourself simple acts because again a forest might be far away you might not have a garden but there might be in your city a tree you can go and sit next to it um, you can start to germinate an acorn in your home, which I did during the pandemic. <laughs> so there, I think there's all these small acts that can actually help you to recenter in a way and to rewild yourself in that way, because you know, we cannot all go right now into the wild in the wilderness. So, Celine, I'm going to jump in. Sorry, you've got, you've got. 30 seconds or 20 <laughs> seconds just to give uh, well, us <laughs> everybody has been so eloquent um that i i just want to echo what has already been said um to be gentle with yourself to not think you can save the world on your own and by yourself again a lesson from an indigenous leader who says to me celine relax the problems didn't happen overnight you by yourself are not going to solve them overnight just take one step forward and so that's i i can just encourage everybody to do that every morning just wake up Take a couple deep breaths and say, here we go again, and do what you can and support the people who are out there. Well, I just want to thank all of you for being an incredible panel, for taking time out of your day to all the questions, the viewers, everybody who's tuned in. Um, the work doesn't stop and doesn't end here on World Environment Day. It is time for nature. The world is um, calling out for a change. Our um, you know, relationship with nature is now more important than ever. If nature fails, we fail. So let's be gentle with ourselves. Let's rewild ourselves. Let's find time to connect with each other, the diversity of each other, the diversity of the natural world, bringing us together as one species amongst many on this spaceship Earth. Um, the museum will have um, links if you want to follow the work of the individuals, um, Sandy, Ben, Sam, Elise, and Celine. Um, you can find them on the museum's website. Um, spread the word using the hashtag for nature. And we will be back on Sunday um, at the same time with another panel um, around plastic pollution. So we look forward to you tuning in. We appreciate you taking this time. Um, thank you to all of you for giving nature a voice. And uh, thank you to all of you who have spent time tuning in with us. Happy World Environment Day. Um, onwards we go. Onwards indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.